Hey, this is going to be that coaching video that uh, we put uh, out for you each week to help you as you prepare to lead, facilitate, teach an on-campus small group. That's going to meet on Sunday, uh, May the 8th, which, as you know, is Mother's Day. If you didn't know that, now you do. So get prepared, get ready for that. Hey, uh, I've certainly been enjoying this series that we've been going through entitled, entitled Hello, My Name is God. And as we've looked at the different names that God uses to help us understand who He is and how He works and and just His character uh, uh, and uh, how that then uh, relates to us and re- or relates to us in, in our relationship with Him. And so I know you have as well. Sorry we've not had one for the last couple of weeks. I was uh, out of the office uh uh, for a week, and uh, so now I'm back, and we're going to get that in your hands, and hopefully it'll be helpful uh, to you as uh, you get ready to uh, to teach your group, uh, your own campus group, Sunday. We're going to be looking at a very familiar passage. Uh, it's a passage out of Ephesians 4 for many of us. Uh, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and uh, so I think you're going to find it's going to be a, a study that you're going to enjoy preparing for, and one that you're going to enjoy teaching as well. We're going to be looking uh, there at the concept of how God has put all of us together into the body of Christ to carry out uh, the mission that he has given us. Uh, we'll focus on the word ministry. We'll use that. Of course, the ministry that we do is all designed in carrying out the mission that God has given us there. So we're going to be looking at that. And that's kind of the big idea uh, of how God has put together, brought together all of us uh, as believers in Jesus, made us part of his church. And when we speak of his church, we're not talking about just our local church here, this local congregation, but we're talking about the church made up of all believers around the world and to carrying out the mission that he has given to us, that he handed off to us, that uh, Jesus said that he'd been sent to do, and now he sends us into that mission of making the gospel known throughout the whole world. So that's kind of what we're going to be looking at. And on page one there, if you, by the way, if you haven't printed out your uh, lesson uh, manuscript, go ahead and get that done, get it in front of you, grab your Bible. Page one is the overview, gives you the big idea that we just talked about. And uh, there's a teaching tip there that I would encourage you to look at. In fact, all the teaching tips that you're going to find, the gray shaded areas in this lesson are very helpful for you. So don't overlook those. Uh, and, and maybe uh, there are some things there that you can use to help you as you uh, share and talk and discuss this, this material with uh, your own group, on campus small group members. Page uh, two and three is the introduction. And uh, it is, uh, again, that introduction is designed to help you as you get ready to uh, transition whether it's your 9 o'clock hour where you've kind of been gathering up, arriving, kind of kind of just having some good time together, fellowship and catching up on your week, into uh, the lesson itself, or if you're coming into the your small group from the uh, 9 o'clock worship hour, you can actually even use uh, maybe some things that you've heard from Brett's message there uh, as he uh, speaks about uh, from uh, using, again, one of the, the compound names of God where we're going to be looking at where God refers to him as Jehovah Nisi. Uh, he is our banner. He is my banner. So you can use either one of those, whatever fits you are. If there's just something else that, that kind of clicks with you as you're preparing that, then be sure and use that. Make it your own. As we always say, uh, use this material uh, to help you and encourage, guide you, to give you that to work with, but always make it your own. Now, on page four, we move into teaching the text. And as we get into the text, we're going to be looking, as I said, at at a a passage of Scripture that's familiar to many of us. It's out of the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 and then drop down and look at 11 through 16 to be the focus. I encourage you to read all of those verses there several times in preparation for teaching this uh, particular passage of Scripture yourself. Again, it is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it speaks to the very heart of what church is to, to be about and about the heart of being being a part of the church and how God has brought that together. Now we're going to be looking, there's basically about three major teaching points that we'll be looking at here throughout this lesson. And the first one is there on page four, which where it refers to, uh, says, each Christian is a part of a greater whole. And what we're talking about there, and what you're going to be looking at there, is the oneness 
that is to exist and that should exist within the people of God. There is an emphasis on oneness. You'll notice that from uh, these uh, first seven verses as a repetition of the word one and talking about the oneness that we have together. Sometimes that's referred to as the unity that we have within uh, the people of God. And notice there is a distinction between unity and uniformity. We're not talking about everybody looking alike, talking alike, acting alike, and so forth. Unity is the sense of where you bring together people from different backgrounds, different personalities, uh, different makeups, uh, even from uh, different different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds, racials, racial uh, background, whatever it is that would separate us out, that we tend to separate ourselves out with here, and brings all those people together and makes them one. There's a oneness, there's a unity that it develops where people of God work together, empowered by the Spirit of God to carry out the mission that God has for us. That's what we're talking about there. In fact, we see that in John chapter 17 where Jesus there in verses 20 through 21, as he prayed for us, when he was getting ready to go, before he was getting ready to go to the cross, he prayed for us. He prayed for me. He prayed for you. He prayed for those who were yet to believe in him. That's me and you. And he prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And the interesting thing about that, if you continue to read through there, is that oneness as we, the uniqueness of bringing all these different people together and who are so different, different in so many ways, bring them together. They're made one through the work of the Spirit of God, and as we are made one, we reveal the reality of who Jesus is. And so that's what we're looking at when we talk about each Christian as a part of the greater uh, uh, greater whole there. Now on page five, you move into that discussion, and you'll notice there that he uh, talks about, the, again, that oneness, and it uh, which really goes against the individuality, uh, the, the individualism of our society, because we're right, noting here that there is a connectedness within the body of Christ, and that which connects us together is Jesus and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit uh, that brings us all together and connects us and makes us one. And the outworking of that is seen through the aspect where we should have a perspective, an attitude of being givers instead of takers. In other words, what we should be thinking is we're part of this body of Christ and there's oneness. And what develops that oneness and keeps that oneness so strong is when we have a perspective to say, how can I contribute? Uh, how can I contribute? To, to the work of the mission? How can I contribute to the work of the ministry in that local congregation where I find myself instead of what can this church contribute to me? And when we fall into the latter aspect, that's when we uh, when the unity begins to, to, to dissolve and the oneness that God has made us begins to disappear. Uh, in fact, uh, the latter will always create a sense of dissatisfaction uh, and that comes into play oftentimes with the, um, what we see in our society today in regards to the consumer aspect uh, of church life, where we're going to see what can we get from a church, what can a church give to me, instead of how can I contribute to the mission that God has through that particular local church. Now we move into the second major teaching point, which is each individual part of the church is indispensable. Almost sounds if we're contradicting what we said in the first, but it's not. Because what we're talking about, though, we're greater. Of a part, a part, every one of us is greater, is a part of the greater whole. Then, but we are all individuals who make up that whole, and and as those individuals, we are all indispensable to what God is doing. In the sense that every individual, every person in the body of Christ, is needed and is vital and is important and is necessary. There are no unnecessary members of the body of Jesus. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31, Paul makes that point very strongly there and in a very vivid way. You might want to go read that passage and think that through in relation to what we're talking about here. and helps us understand Though there is one body, it is made up of many different parts or many different members, and they together make a whole. And there is an interdependency that exists there within the body of Christ. It's like we're pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And when you all the pieces are in place, you've got this, this puzzle that gives a, gives a really nice picture, and it's seen as whole, but if one of the pieces are missing... It just doesn't seem to be what it could be. 
that's what we're talking about here in this particular teaching point there. And then we come down to uh, the last point. It says we are all supposed to do our part to accomplish the work of ministry. And a good discussion in there, especially in regards, there's two questions. They uh, are some questions there that I've asked uh, for you to think through with your group that will be very helpful in that. How do we view ministry? Do we view ministry as that which is done by a select few individuals or as a responsibility of just a few? Sometimes we think of that being ministry as a responsibility of those who are on a church staff that are paid uh, to do the work of the ministry. When in the reality, the scripture makes it clear that the that those that God has given to put in places of roles of leadership, that their responsibility is not to do all of the ministry. They are ministers and they do ministry, but their role is to equip and enable others to carry out the ministry. And therefore, the ministry multiplies and the ministry is done more effectively. And the, the mission of God <clears throat> is being carried out. And that major teaching point there at the end focuses upon upon that aspect of that there. And uh, there's, a, there's a statement on page 7 that I think you ought to think about for yourself a little bit. And, and I would really look at a way to call your, your small group to think this through, <clears throat> that gr God's brilliant plan is to set the people free to do ministry. That, is, that ought to be the objective of every congregation, <coughs> is to set the people free to do the ministry. Instead of making the ministry a responsibility of few, let's, dis let's free up everyone to do ministry. Because what happens when you just have a few people carrying out the responsibility of ministry? It becomes very limited, right? But when it is distributed to many people, then it becomes extensive. And the, the work of God is known in that community and all around the world. Notice that there's a question about midway through page 7. It talks about when we talk about church growing, we tend to think about numbers. But in Ephesians 4, notice what the emphasis is there. The emphasis on, on when the, when the <clears throat> excuse me, when the, there's a oneness, when people recognize there have been gifts, gifted people given to the church to help enable others to carry out what the responsibility God has given to all of us. <clears throat> that the end result of that, obviously there will be growth, but the end result is that there is a maturing of the people of God. There is a, there is a Christ-likeness that develops within the congregation as a whole, and that makes an impact on their community for the gospel as well as around the world. And growth will not occur without all of us. The growth, the maturity will not occur without all of us contributing. Uh, I, I would think that an implication here is that unless all of us are contributing, the maturity of the body will never be what it could be. And the, the impact that congregation can have on this community for the gospel would never be what it could be. Uh, the discussion wraps up on page 8. And uh, in that, I want to point out that there is a very, very good, the third paragraph down, where it talks about some examples of what we've heard in churches, <clears throat> different churches over the years. Those would be, <clears throat> and I apologize, I've kind of got a scratchy throat today. Those would be some excellent statements to throw out for your class to respond to and to think through. In fact, some of them may even have some to add to that and give some illustrations of that, of what we've all heard over the years, and then for you to talk about, delve into why those are not correct understandings of ministry and of how God has put us together to carry out the work that God has for us to do. Uh, you know, one of the things that, having been a pastor for 30 plus years, one of the things I come to understand as I, as I uh, studied and meditated and thought through this particular passage more and more is I have had a lot of people over the years come to me and say uh, something like, Pastor, we need to do this. Or, Pastor, why don't we get involved in this? And usually what they mean by that is, Pastor, why don't you do this? Or why don't you get involved in this? 
And not necessarily that I shouldn't. I'm not saying that. But here's what I've come to understand, not only from this passage, but from how God has put us together and how God speaks to each of us as individuals as part of that larger body, is what I've come to understand. If God put that on your heart, God placed that burden upon you in the sense of a a good thing, then God has intended for you to carry that out, for you to do something about that. And to hand that off to someone else or seek to hand that off to someone else is then to neglect what God has for you to do. And not only will the oneness of the body be affected, but the effectiveness of the ministry would be affected as well. There's a good closing uh, discussion there, and I encourage you uh, to look at that. Maybe some things you can actually throw out with your own Kappa Small Group as you wind up. Hey, thanks for being a part of those that help others um, grow in their relationship with God, the discipleship process that we have here at Dayspring. And thank you for being one who is embracing the ministry in a way that it is, uh, you're not only part of that group that is embracing ministry, but you're encouraging others in your own campus small group to become those that embrace ministry and multiplying that out in a phenomenal way. God bless.